you very much for carving out time from your busy schedules to learn more about how mechanistic PBPK modeling is being used to help predict food effect as early as possible in drug development programs and in some limited ways today supporting regulatory interactions. What I'd like to do over the course of the next 45 to 60 minutes is provide you with an overview of the current status from a regulatory perspective. Go through the evolution of food effect prediction strategies. Talk a little bit about a couple case studies and wrap up with some next steps and conclusions. We will follow the presentation with a live Q&A session. Sit back and enjoy. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have an interest in PBPK modeling. And boy, is it a great time to have that experience and skill set. Now, it's been a while since I have done a job search, but an exercise that I started several years ago was to go to a popular job search website in the United States called Indeed.com and see how many job openings there are around the United States where PBPK modeling was a requirement or preferred qualification. When I started this exercise back in November 2018, there were 42 job openings available. When I repeated the exercise one year later, there was a 25% increase in the number of job openings in the United States where PBPK modeling was a preferred skill set. When I repeated that exercise one year later in November 2020, there was another 25 to 30% increase in the number of job openings. And then things took off and we have reached an inflection point, as you can see here over the last year or so. In November 2021, there were over two times as many job openings available where PBPK skills were necessary. And the really interesting thing is that it's companies of all shapes and sizes across all different types of departments who are looking for this skill set. Large pharma, mid sized pharma, small companies, biotech firms, even companies outside the pharmaceutical and biotech space. If you want to ensure that you have job security for the rest of your career, continue to utilize, learn, and apply PVPK modeling. Now, what's one of the reasons why there's such an explosion in the adoption of this kind of technology? Well, there's been a very, very big push from regulatory agencies specifically led by the US FDA to encourage more use of this type of approach to support drug development. In 2018, the FDA published the first guidance document that was devoted exclusively to PVPK modeling. 
where they did an excellent job of outlining what are some of the steps and the requirements for developing the PBPK model and reporting on the results. In 2020, a new draft guidance was published by the FDA on the use of PBPK modeling specifically for biopharmaceutic applications, supporting oral drug product development, manufacturing changes, and controls. About one month after another draft guidance was published, this one on the evaluation of gastric pH dependent drug interactions with acid reducing agents or proton pump inhibitors. And in this draft guidance, there are specific sections which reference PBPK modeling and simulation. What about food effect? Unfortunately, in the draft guidance published in 2019, when I did a search for PBPK in the guidance, there were no hits which appeared. However, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't think about how you can apply PBPK modeling to support drug development when it comes to food effect predictions. We know that during the course of drug development, food effect considerations are going to need to be made as early as possible. When we start to prepare for our IND and get ready for our early um, phase one studies with our simple formulations, we're going to have to do a food effect study to evaluate whether or not we're likely to see a positive or negative food effect. As we progress further into development and start optimizing some of these early formulations, it may be necessary for us to repeat those food effect studies. And as we're getting closer to filing our new drug application, or if we're going the 505B2 uh, route, um, there may be another request to perform a food effect study with our marketed formulation. The strategies which have been proposed by your peers in industry are to try and conduct these food effect studies as early as possible. More importantly, try to conduct PBPK simulations of food effect as early as possible. There may be, there may be opportunities to apply PBPK modeling to waive additional food effect studies if as we're optimizing formulations and preparing our marketed product, if those changes are minor. And this is where, especially in collaboration with the FDA, we have these opportunities to engage in scientific advice meetings to talk about the proposed changes to the formulation and with the FDA determine if they are minor enough where they could be supported, uh, the food effect study results supported by PBPK modeling and simulation. And there is evidence from some of the publications which have come out from the FDA over the course of the last two years. This one on the left is a summary of the 2018-2019 submissions 
received by the US FDA Office of Clinical Pharmacology, where PVPK modeling and simulation was referenced. And you can see that 2% of the 116 applications were focused on food effect simulations. In 2021, the FDA Division of Biopharmaceutics published an article summarizing over the course of a 10-year period, the applications that have been received specifically focused on biopharmaceutic applications. And you can see that there are a couple of cases where the effect of food was simulated and supported in these guidance, uh, in these applications from the sponsor companies. In both the applications reviewed by the Office of Clinical Pharmacology and in the applications uh, reviewed by the Division of Biopharmaceutics, the food effect simulations were used to support those minor formulation changes and could be in some cases used to waive those food effect studies that are typically required. Now, what I'd like to talk a little bit about next is the evolution of food effect predictions and what are today proposed PPPK workflows for establishing your validated baseline model and applying that to predict the impact of food. Over 15 years ago, there were quite a few evaluations performed to see how well could the biopharmaceutical classification system, BCS, be used to predict both the likelihood and the direction of a food effect. And so from this publication from GU in 2007, using maximum absorbable dose, dose number, and the log D of the drug, they were able to predict accurately or classify accurately whether class one through class four drugs had no positive or negative food effects for 60 to 70 percent of the cases. This is not bad. So just based upon, again, BCS criteria, solubility considerations, permeability considerations, approximately 60 to 70 percent of the classifications could be predicted well. Was there a food effect or not and whether it was positive or negative? No quantitative measures, though, just simply yes or no, food effect, positive or negative. Some of the early mechanistic food effect predictions were seen back over 20 years ago. In this publication, one of the earliest from Simulations Plus, we were able to successfully predict the impact of the administration of grapefruit juice on the exposure of midazolam, where we had developed baseline models across several doses of midazolam without any grapefruit juice administered, and then predict the PK following the uh, administration of a glass of grapefruit juice. And we know that grapefruit juice uh, inhibits, in some cases, the uh, 3A4 effect of midazolam in the gut. And this increased exposure could be modeled well by uh, adjusting some of those Michaelis Menten parameters uh, for gut metabolism. To try and account for the actual impact of food 
food stuff that we would eat. Um, colleagues from Roche presented this really nice early prediction and publication on the impact of bioRelevant solubility data to mimic that impact of food. So here was some of the very first uh, indications of leveraging as input FASIF or FESIF solubility data to try and capture the food effect. And we can see that at different dose levels, uh, for a BCS class two drug, the increases due to the presence of food were well predicted by adjusting that solubility input using the measured in vitro FESIF solubility data. So using that data reflected nicely the increased solubility at the higher biosol concentrations, which drove that uh, increase in PK exposure due to the presence of food. The FDA decided to also try and capture and better understand some of the impact of food uh, in their early research activities with PVPK modeling and published this article in 2010, which was really not focused uh, just on food effect predictions, but instead about how you can apply PBPK modeling uh, to support quality by design in drug development. And during the course of the case studies presented in this publication, the FDA did capture for carbamazepine at different dose levels the food effects. And from some of the results in this uh, snippet of a table from that publication, you can see that these food effects were predicted well across doses and different formulation types, whether it was suspensions, immediate release tablets, or extended release tablet or capsule products. The FDA continued with their regulatory assessment and presented some results at the AAPS conference in 2017 and then published this article in 2018 on the predictive performance of PBPK modeling for the effect of food on oral drug absorption. And using a bottom-up approach and leveraging the uh, fasted state PK data to help with the building and validating of the baseline model. The prospective predictions for approximately 40 drugs showed that 90% of the AUC ratio changes between the fed and fasted state studies were captured within twofold. And 60% of these cases were quantitatively captured within 1.25 fold. This was very promising results. And in this plot that we see here, comparing the predicted AUC ratio changes versus the observed, we can see that um, the BCS class one compounds are those among, uh, are the class which are among the very best predicted. There's still opportunities even for the BCS two or two slash four compounds to also be well predicted. And the accuracy started to fall off a little bit when we were working with exclusively class three or class four drugs. And we'll talk a little bit more 
about why that is when we come and uh, speak to the negative food effect predictions. To try and build up more momentum behind the use of PBPK modeling to support food effect projections. The Gastro Plus user group published this excellent summary publication, this review article, where authors from a number of different companies submitted case studies. And as part of that review article, they also outlined one of the very first industry workflows. <clears throat> Their focus in the publication was on BCS class one and class two drugs, where the major mechanism for food effect is related to bile solubilization or supersaturation. And the steps that were proposed were to first build the human PBPK model, taking uh, advantage of all of the physical chemical properties in vitro and or in silico, leveraging some of the clinical PK data, uh, especially under fasted conditions to help with building up and validating the model and if necessary, using some of that fasted state PK data to optimize. Once that model, that baseline model was in place, then we can apply it to start predicting for the food effect. And what we want to do is to try and predict and verify the food effect outcomes with some clinical food effect data. And if necessary, <clears throat> use some of that observed PK data from the food effect study to optimize some of the underlying parameters. This was for the early stage food effect studies that would be performed early in clinical development. <clears throat> and then as we get to the later stages and start thinking about what our optimized formulation strategies are going to be, we would start to then take this verified food effect model and incorporate some of the formulation related changes to simulate and predict what would be the new uh, food effect outcomes. The goal for us was to try to see if we could mitigate the food effect if necessary, or when confidence is high, predict the food effect for market formulations and see if we could leverage some of those simulation results to inform the drug label. And coming back here to this early stage step, what we can do is to try and leverage some of the early stage results to help with the optimization of the formulation. Run parameter sensitivity analysis, run scenario-based simulation simulations or virtual population outcomes to help us decide in which direction do we want to go with our formulations in order to try and mitigate any early food effect outcomes that we have seen. If we can have a product where there is no food effect and we don't have to include any special instructions in the uh, drug product label, well, that would be the preferred outcome. Building on some of that work that was published by the Gastro Plus user group, an IQ consortium working group was formed 
um, which also consisted of members of a number of different companies who contributed case studies and have published several articles, which I'll reference more coming up. And in their 2020 and 2021 publications, they have presented some updated workflows for middle out approaches, where we try and take some of that in vitro data to build up the uh, model. We'll try and take some of that fasted state PK data to help with the validation stage. And then we'll also try and take some of that early stage food effect data to help uh, um, with a middle out approach. And once we've been able to identify with that early food effect PK data, what are the major mechanisms which are driving that food effect which is observed, then we can take that model and apply it in a number of different ways, whether it's to help continue informing some of our internal research and development activities, or to maybe support regulatory interactions. And as part of this publication, uh, they also did a really nice job for 30 drugs of predicting the food effect and um, classifying the predictions as either low, medium, or high confidence prediction areas. But for 23 out of the 30 cases, so about 80% of the cases that were modeled, there was a medium to high confidence in the prediction outcomes. And so in these green, and yellow pie slices in this star plot here. We can see what type of compounds were modeled. In many cases, it's BCS classes one or two. And what were the mechanisms for the food effect? Which in many cases will be related to the uh, the either solubilization of drug based upon bile salts, the gastric emptying effects, or so on. In the 20% or so of cases where there is low confidence, it is typically going to be BCS class two or three drugs, and there are some special mechanisms which are responsible for causing the observed food effects which we will talk more about uh, in the conclusions. So there's been a nice evolution of in our abilities to be able to predict food effect. And this has been something which has been published on many times over the course of the last few years, especially. So when we're talking about modeling and predicting food effect changes, what are some of the special, <clears throat> special changes in parameters that we're accounting for in our PBPK setup? When we account for the impact of food on the change in GI physiology, at a high level, some of those changes are going to be gastric and in small intestine volumes, changes in the pH, both in the gastric and upper intestinal environments, delayed or longer gastric emptying, higher bile salt concentrations, <coughs> and higher mesenteric and liver blood flows. Now, as more information has been published over the years, uh, where a more detailed <coughs> study and evaluation of the GI changes due to the presence of food have been measured, 
we are able to now specify more precisely the impact of the composition of these meals on such parameters as gastric empty or bile salt concentrations. Gastric emptying is linearly related. There is a good correlation to caloric intake. Unfortunately, there's not a very good correlation between gastric emptying and meal volume. And so when we do want to try and account for something like the changes to gastric emptying, what's going to be most important is having an understanding on the caloric intake more so than the actual volume of the meal. And in general, most meals will contain a mixture of fat and protein and carbohydrates. So any small changes by completely modifying the meal intake is probably not worth worrying about. Where the composition of the meal will be important, though, in terms of fats versus proteins versus carbohydrates, will be in the calor uh, in the bile salt concentrations. And so here, some data published a few years ago showing the impact of taking Insure Plus and measuring bile salt concentrations along with any changes in pH, <clears throat> shows that the concentrations can easily be double or triple the median in a fed state environment uh, with a normal caloric meal. And so now compiling a lot of this information, the changes to gastric emptying, the changes to bile salt concentration based upon caloric intake and or the composition of the meal, commercial software like Gastro Plus has become more intelligent. And there are now opportunities to be able to select when you want to simulate for the food effect, what is the caloric intake? And what is the percent of fat content in that meal? And in the case of Gastro Plus, there will be many meal types uh, which are built into the software by default, where you have standard caloric intake values and the standard percent fat content in those meals. Or as mentioned earlier, you have the opportunity to specify a very precise meal uh, if you know caloric intake and or fat content. And this will then impact things like gastric emptying and bile salt concentrations. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is just spend a couple minutes talking about positive and negative food effects and how your peers today are utilizing this kind of technology to guide formulation development or what are some special considerations and maybe some additional experiments you may consider running? In 2014, uh, friends from Novartis published a really nice article talking about how they apply PBPK modeling to formulation development to try to mechanistically investigate the impact of food and see how they could leverage some of that investigation to potentially design and assess different formulation strategies. The compound that they evaluated was still a, a live project for them, still in development. Uh, it's a BCS class two, class four drug which has low solubility that is pH dependent and we can see that uh, illustrated here on this solubility versus pH plot on the right. It had moderate to high permeability, so this is where the class two, class four designation comes into play. Uh, 
leveraging some of the standard inputs into the model and doing a bottom up slash middle out type approach where we leverage as much in vitro data as we can find on the physical chemical properties, utilize what we know about GI physiology, especially what's built into the software platforms. And then in this case, utilizing a compartmental pharmacokinetic approach uh, with some available IV and or oral PK data to help determine what the two compartment PK parameters would look like. With this data, <clears throat> along with some of the early fasted state oral PK data, the model was developed and validated. So leveraging this information here, along with some of the observed PK data from the fasted state studies at different dose levels, the baseline model was validated. Then the model was utilized and applied to predict the food effect and verify it with those clinical PK studies. And what you can see is that there was there, there were good prospective predictions of the food effect at the 200 and 400 milligram dose levels. But what Novartis was even more concerned about was not so much how accurate the simulations were, but the fact that there was such a substantial food effect observed for these early formulations. And so a question that Novartis was hoping to try and answer was, would there be opportunities to try and design the formulations in such a way or optimize them to mitigate the food effect? And so there's opportunities to set up a design of experiments type approach in these modeling and simulation platforms like Gastro Plus to see through combinations of formulation parameters we control, whether it's particle size distributions or particle shapes or precipitation times or uh, dose volumes, dose amounts, are there ways in which we can try to design out or mitigate that food effect? So following the design of experiment simulations, these sensitivity analysis plots were produced. And what we see here are the results under fasted and underfed conditions. Here, in this three-dimensional sensitivity analysis plot, we have the fraction absorbed on the z-axis with the dose and particle size on the xy-axis. And as long as we can um, design our particle sizes into the nanometer range, we will have complete absorption across the entire clinical dose range. We saw the same trends under the fed conditions as well. So as long as Novartis could design a nanoparticle formulation, the exposure predictions would be the same under both fed and fasted conditions across the clinical dose ranges. There was an opportunity to be able to mitigate that food effect. So API particle size reduction was one option. These results were further validated in virtual bioequivalence trial simulations where a fasted versus fed crossover study was performed. And 
what we can see in the population outcomes is that with a D50 in the particle size distribution of 10 nanometers, the fasted and fed simulation results are bioequivalent. They fall within the 80 to 125 range when calculating the Cmax and AUC ratios between the fasted and fed conditions. Now, unfortunately, Novartis, as the drug development uh, programs continued for this compound, decided that manufacturing these formulations down to the nanoparticle range was not going to be cost effective. And so they ultimately continued with a standard micronized formulation uh, in order to uh, get the drug approved and have special labeling instructions uh, or special dosing instructions in the drug product label. But this is a really nice case study showing how you can today begin to leverage PBPK modeling and simulation early in your drug development programs to set or identify formulation strategies to mitigate a food effect which is observed. Now, what about negative food effects, <clears throat> which are a little bit more difficult to mechanistically predict? Here's a really nice publication on the impact of food on the disintegration and dissolution of a BCS class three compound. So this was for the drug Trospium HCL, which is extremely hydrophilic with a very, very high solubility and a very low permeability. So the researchers here, which included Professor Gordon Amidon, one of the pioneers in biopharmaceutics, measured the solubility, disintegration, and dissolution of different trospium HCL formulations uh, with different HPMC or GUAR content levels in the formulations. So with different disintegrant levels or polymers. And what we can see is that as the viscosity, the viscosity of these products increased, the solubilities decreased The disintegration times increased and the dissolution versus time decreased as well. These changes in viscosity were thought to try and mimic what would be some of the changes in gastric emptying. And so could we leverage some of this in vitro dissolution data that we measured for these different formulations which have different levels of excipients to try and capture the food effect for trospium. So the same steps has been described in some of those uh, earlier industry workflows and also in the last case study were followed here, where in vitro physical chemical and formulation data was used along with the clinical PK data under fasted conditions to understand the impact of food, uh, to understand the PK and capture it well under fasted conditions with no food. And once we have that validated model in place, then applying it to do a purely prospective prediction of the food effect using some of this in vitro dissolution data 
for these different formulations to mimic the viscosity effects seen with food. And what we can see here is that directionally, the predictions are good. We are able to capture that negative food effect with confidence. But the extent, the quantitative impact was over predicted compared to what was ultimately observed. So this prospective prediction from the fasted state PK model that was validated does capture the negative food effect, but not to the extent which was observed. So what could be some explanations for this gap here between the prospective prediction and the observation? Well, there were some additional there was some additional work published talking about the impact of ion pairing with bile salts which can modulate intestinal permeability and contribute to the food drug interaction so trospium with its uh, formal charge would bind to the bile salt that's present under fast conditions and form an ion pair, which would lead to improved absorption across the intestinal membrane. When food is present, there is an interruption of this ion pair formula formation. And so the trospium with its low permeability does not form the ion pair with the bile salt because of this competition or interruption. And with food, the trospium with its formal charge has that low permeability and will have reduced absorption. Another explanation for negative food effects, especially that food drug interaction and the impact on permeability was illustrated nicely in a Gastro Plus user group webinar from 2015. The presenters here had tried to do some prospective food effect predictions for a compound and they were over predicting the negative food effect. That negative food effect was not captured quantitatively using some of the original CACO2 data that was measured in standard buffer recipes. But there was a very, very nice publication that had come out which describes utilizing in the donor compartments of the CACO2 experiments some modified FESIF recipes to try and measure whether or not there would be any changes to the absorptive permeability or the absorptive permeability ratios when you're using standard buffer solutions to mimic a normal fasted state environment to measure CACO2 permeabilities versus using a FESF like recipe and seeing whether or not the presence of bile salts may impact the permeability coefficients which are measured in these CACO2 experiments. So the presenters in this webinar did those experiments and with the ratio of the biorelevant PAP in the FESF to FASF environments was applied, the simulations of the food effect were, were captured extremely well. So doing some additional in vitro experimental work with modified CACO2 experiments 
could lead to improved predictions, especially when the food effects are impacting the permeability of the drug. And in a, another conference, there were some additional presentations given and outlined talking about some newer experimental designs to try and measure those changes in permeability values or permeability or absorptive fluxes. And how utilizing these ratios between the normal solution or FASF environments and the FESF environments for these permeability fluxes would lead to better inputs into the PBPK simulations and a better capturing of the food effect outcomes. So we've just talked about some case studies where we can take some of that in vitro and fasted state PK data and have it be applied to predict food effect outcomes. Depending upon the food effect mechanism, uh, which is responsible for driving the positive or negative outcomes, we can reliably and with high confidence predict with those PBPK models the resulting uh, information. But we've also talked about in some cases, especially when negative food effects are observed, how there may need to be some additional experimental work done in the in vitro setting to evaluate the impact of food on permeability coefficients. So what is next? Last year, there was a, another very, very nice publication which came from that IQ consortium and the working group that focused on food effect predictions, where they focused on improving the predictive performance of the low confidence food effect models. And they outline in the publication areas for companies like Simulations Plus to focus on over the next few years. Trying to understand better the impact of food on stomach or gastric solubility and maybe considering some uh, FESF state stomach solubility uh, uh, measurements to use as input into the models. Potentially modeling the reacidification of the gastric environment after food, after some time, the uh, stomach pH environment will return to its baseline values and accounting for that in the PBPK simulations. Modeling common ion effects and the impact of drug precipitation kinetics based upon the presence of food and seeing if we can't leverage some more data to try and improve some of those um, estimates of common ion effects or precipitation rates. And then there are some longer term uh, research projects which require collaboration between software vendors, industry, regulatory agencies, and academia including modeling the spatial effects as drug is transiting along the GI tract more accurately. The hydrodynamics of food uh, uh, or hydrodynamics of the drug interacting with the food as it's moving along the GI tract and the impact that can have. And then the interactions of food with the enzymes and the transport themselves for which some of these drugs are substrates. So there's still work to be done, but we are talking about just 20% of the cases which have been evaluated by industry 
uh, in several publications and also to an extent regulatory bodies as well. So we're close, we're close. The confidence in PBPK predictions of food effect is increasing. And the application of these models does help early on. Please try to apply these approaches as early as you can to help understand the um, strategies that you might be able to take with formulations and to also help identify and understand better safety risks, especially if you're going to need to consider things like the content of meals, the dosing frequency, and so on in the labeling instructions. Identifying through mechanistic PVPK simulations what will be some information that can inform drug product labels. There are some real opportunities today to be able to leverage the PBPK simulations to maybe waive some food effect studies that occur later in development, but these are only going to be available if you're making minor formulation changes. And this is where it's strongly encouraged to engage with the regulatory agencies as early as possible about the state of your current PBPK models, the models that you have already developed and validated with the existing in vitro and preclinical and early stage clinical fasted state studies, and outlining what are these formulation changes you plan to make and what your modeling and simulation strategy is going to look like. So be prepared in your discussions with regulatory uh, agencies uh, and make sure that you have outlined a good modeling and simulation strategy plan. There is still work to be done. Uh, there's improvements in both the modeling mechanisms and, and the experimental techniques which are gonna be needed. There might be some additional in vitro studies that we would recommend you run in order to better understand that interaction of food with properties like permeability, for example. And as more work continues to be published, showing the validation and the verification of these food effect results, uh, the regulatory bodies will continue to gather, will continue to try and harmonize on suggested workflows and acceptance criteria. Uh, and this will give everybody around the world more guidance and confidence in the approaches that they take going forward. Thank you very much for the attention that you've given. And we'll now open it up to questions. Thank you very much for uh, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, uh, uh, 大家, uh, 上面我们开, 我们, uh, 完成了这个, uh, food effect 的直播环节, 那接下来之后呢, 我们进行答疑的过程, 在答疑的这个环节中，呃，首先呢，我们会根据大家收集到的问题，就是那个课程报名之前的这个问题呢，先做一个呃相应的汇总。那大家在这个过程中呢，如果有相应有别的新的问题呢，也可以在那个呃小
I think, John, maybe first uh, we can um, go through some of the questions related with the submission. So I think these four questions are really uh, uh, similar, or we could combine them together. So the main question will be, so uh, does the regulated agency such as the FDA or uh, IMPA like currently approve mechanistic model for predicting food effect? And also, is there any case study about uh, um, the regulatory agency waiving of the food effect clinical studies through PBPK modeling? Yeah, Jiang, could you give some uh, an, an explanation or answer on such type, uh, type of question? Yeah, thank you, Haiying, for the question. And thank you for uh, to the audience member who submitted it. Um, I do believe that there is lots and lots of interest in applying uh, mechanistic PBPK modeling to support uh, food effect evaluation. And uh, not only from a research and development perspective, but also from a regulatory interaction perspective. And as you saw in the webinar, the industry is pushing very, very hard on the regulatory agencies by providing lots of case studies and lots of evidence showing when we can have high, moderate, or low confidence in the prediction capabilities with the PBPK models for food effect. And today, the guidance recommendations um, do not fully support providing food of uh, PBPK simulations for food effect interactions. However, however, um, depending upon the complexity of formulation changes that you may make. And this is from an earlier slide in the presentation as well, where I highlighted where during the drug development process, you will need to consider conducting food effect studies during drug development. There is a requirement to conduct the food effect studies when you make a change to your formulation as your uh, drug development program is advancing from phase one to phase two to phase three studies and you're starting to settle on your marketed formulation. If the formulation changes that you are making during drug development are minor, and the definition of minor is not completely clear yet, but the FDA is open to having a scientific advice meeting to help explain what a minor formulation change would look like. If that formulation change is minor and you have a validated PBPK model in place, uh, which has been um, validated using both fasted and some earlier fed state PK data, you may, you may have an opportunity to waive any additional food effect studies which might be required based upon the minor formulation changes you've made. So there is an opportunity today to use PBPK modeling and simulation to waive food effect studies for minor, minor formulation changes as your program is advancing through drug development. And there are some cases, uh, examples include uh, the panel binostat and uh, seridinib compounds, and I will put those drug names in the chat window in one second, but there is evidence where PBPK simulations were used in the supporting 
uh, documentation as part of the NDA submitted to the FDA. I think maybe I uh, so can give some brief uh, summary in in Chinese. Uh, uh, so, uh, FDA 的这个guidance指导意见还并没有完全支持用PBPK模型来预测这个food effect，但是工业界现在是比较积极推进这个呃模型的预测。首先在药物的这个呃研发阶段。然后是FDV实际上是建议你用这个模型来预测，然后呃，模型来预测food effect，呃，尤其在这个phase one, phase two, phase three，然后呃，还有一些情况，比如说是你有些剂型的变化，formulation的变化，尤其是对一些这个变化比较小的、比较minor的，现在呃，FDA并没有呃明确的指导意见，什么情况下是一些这个minor的一些呃变化。但是你可以组织和FDA之间的一些scientific的meeting 有食物这个餐后情况下的这个PK模型来经过验证的PPPK模型那样的话你就是对于你的新的这个剂型的情况下然后你的PPPK模型 effect这个study有可能是被wave掉的 然后这样后面会给一些这个这样还提到了两个药物然后他后面会会给大家这个药物的名字然后在这个药物的提交的这个审批过程中他们就增加了他们就包括了对用PBPK模型对这个餐后的预测这样 okay. Do you have anything else to add? Not to that uh, question, Haying, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, uh, uh, 具体说来就是说, uh, 用PPPK模型是, 如果你是经过验证的话, uh, 然后是有一些模型, 就是说有一些这个, uh, uh, food effect的临床研究是可以被喂不掉的, 尤其是说如果是和这个formulation这个change, minor formulation change相关的话, 是可以这个被喂不掉的。uh, I think the next question is, uh, um, what, uh, what is the role of modeling with animal data when food effect shows species difference? How can help food effect in clinical trial using modeling results in animals? Yeah, thank you, Haiying, for uh, that question. Thank you to the audience member. And uh, can you just confirm you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay. I don't know what. Tony, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So this uh, slide I'm happy to make available uh, if it's not part of the deck already. But I think it nicely illustrates um, some of the considerations which are already accounted for in PBPK models. Uh, especially with respect to the GI physiology across different species. There is a lot of value in being able to utilize the animal data under both fasted and fed conditions to assess formulation strategies as your clinical formulation prototypes are being developed. And because we can already account for some of these differences that we would see between fasted and fed conditions, for example, bile salt concentrations or pH differences, uh, volumes of fluid uh, and uh, emptying or transit times, 
these differences will already be built into the commercial PBPK software between animals and humans for fasted and fed conditions. So as we are uh, utilizing some of our animal uh, PB, uh, food effect data to build the PBPK models, once we have them validated and have used those to evaluate different formulations, we can then do an extrapolation from the animal to human to predict what would be a early uh, exposure prediction under fed conditions in humans because we will automatically be accounting for some of those differences in the physiology along the gut between humans and animals under fasted or fed conditions. So the animal data does have value. We can use it to help us understand the formulation strategies uh, be, uh, uh, when these uh, formulations are administered with food. And once we have a validated model in place in animals, we can extrapolate and do some early predictions of what the food effect might look like in humans because of these known differences in GI physiology. Yeah. Uh, uh, 呃, 因为在Gastro Plus里面 然后我们是对于不同的这个animal 不同的这个像human 不同的preclinical animal 然后我们是考虑到了它这个 呃, physiological的这个参数的变化 比如说它的这个pH的变化 还有biosalt在这个空腹和这个餐后下面的变化 如果你可以用这个动物的数据来建立模型的话然后可以帮助我们研究这个formulation of strategy 就是我们的这个剂型 然后这个对这个fasted或者是fed condition情况下 有什么变化 如果就是说这个动物的模型可以很好的这个就是说建立好了很好的预测 这个 它的这个餐后的这个呃吸收还有这个PK的模型的话，那也就是说我们就可以再用同样的这个模型这个外推到这个呃到human的情况下到到这个呃到human的情况下，因为它所有的这个生理学参数的变化，我们在这个模型中都
and using that to um, uh, validate and or optimize the model. Um, so it all starts here with your fasted state PK data to have a good baseline PBPK model in place. Um, with this fasted state PK data, uh, our goal is to try and predict the CMAX and the AUC within the bioequivalence range as a target. And if we are not able to do that, uh, the publication does a very nice job of offering some suggestions for how to optimize the baseline model uh, in order to have more confidence in the food effect predictions that you're going to generate. So they offer some different strategies about what sort of Simulation, <clears throat> simulation should you run, like parameter sensitivity analysis, and what type of parameters should you focus on, whether it's precipitation kinetics or permeability or solubility dissolution. Once we have that baseline model developed from the fasted state data, then what we can do is apply it to predict what the food effect will look like. And depending upon whether our predictions of the food effect are within those bioequivalence limits when compared to the observed fed state data or food effect PK data that we generate or not, we would have then a, a designation of whether there is high uh, moderate or low confidence in the model and its ability to predict the food effect. So these are the steps in the suggested workflow for attacking the predictions of food effect. Uh, Haiying, maybe you can translate this first yeah. part and then I'll talk a little bit about the trial design aspect. Yeah. OK， 呃，在这张图上这样，嗯、呃，给出了它是一个在二零二零年的这个一篇文件，然后它在这里面给了一些 decision tree。呃，首先我们如果要建立模型来预测这个餐后的这个 PK 的话，首先我们要建立一个这个 baseline model 一个基础模型，然后这个模型我们也是要基于在这个空腹情况下的 PK 模型，呃 ，PK 数据来建立。首先，我们要看在空腹下面这个 PK 的模型，我们是不是呃，在这个它呃这个 CMAX 和 AUC 在这个 BE 这个呃呃这个呃呃呃这个数据之类的，如果是它呃不能满足这个 BE 的这个要求的话。在这个中间的这幅图上面，他给了一些，在一些不同的情况下，我们如何的去改进这个模型，比如说它是不是有沉降，呃，是不是对于它这个溶解是有问题，然后你可以通呃这个在这幅图上面，他也建议建议了，就是说有一些这个不同的这个呃模拟，你可以进行，比如说是一些这个呃参数的敏感性分析，呃，然后。呃，这样可以帮助我们建立一个，就是经过呃验证的，比比如说有比较有 confidence 的一个这个 PK 的呃模型，然后建立好这个 baseline 的 PK 模型以后，呃，在这个呃空腹情况下，那我们就可以进行这个餐后的预测，然后对于餐后的预测，它也是基于呃这个餐后的预测和这个实测值之间，它这个是不是在 BE。这个呃 range 之内的，如果它是在这个之内的哈，我们定义为它是有这个 high confidence 的。如果没有的话，然后我们也根据不同的这个要求，可以我们可以看到呃，把它嗯、呃、归为这个呃这个 P P P P K 模型或者这个 P K 模型是有中等的这个 confidence moderate 的 confidence 或者是有 low confidence， 然后呃这样进一步进行嗯、呃、其他的这个呃餐后的这个模拟预测。OK， 这样 ，You can continue。Yeah, thank you, Aying.、Um, if we want to try and utilize our PBPK model to help with some of the、uh, trial design aspects,、um, 
what we would want to do is have and I'll go to a different slide here one second. Um, we want to have uh, an understanding of what our uh, therapeutic and safety levels are for uh, the, the PK of the compound. Um, because the food effect predictions will impact the uh, exposure of our drug and knowing what our therapeutic and safety uh, limits or targets are uh, with respect to the PK, what we can do is then try to design and evaluate the food effect studies by running simulations, for example, for different meal types or run simulations where we switch between fasted and fed conditions at different times in order to ensure that we are still falling within our therapeutic and safety limits. Um, this information could then be utilized uh, after we have validated it with some food effects study uh, data to inform the drug labeling, uh, to give some instructions about how this particular product should be uh, taken by the patients, whether they should be eating uh, a normal meal, if they should be eating a high fat or low calorie meal at certain times of day, uh, prior to or after taking the dose, all of that information, the prescribing information that you would see in the drug label, could be informed based upon the PBPK simulations. The key is to make sure that you have followed the steps back on the workflow slide to make sure that you have your validated and verified PBPK models under fasted and fed conditions using the early um, using the early food effect data that is generated in order to then start to inform some of the study design questions when you get into your phase two or phase three trials. Uh uh 那你可以再用 Gastro Plus 然后在 Gastro Plus 里面我们提供了各种不同的这个 time 然后还有不同的这个biosalt这个这个concentration 然后这个PK这个数据可以在这个比如说在这个safety这个range之内啊，然后在这样的情况下的话，然后还可以帮助我们嗯这个进一步呃呃可以呃改进这个labeling。对。Yeah, I think there is another question like from the uh teams. It says FDA um uh claimed. That is the food effect, like the uh, the the accuracy from the food effect prediction is not uh, 
um, good. And also there will be high like uh, uh, prediction error. Uh, so if this is like the what the FDA wrote and uh, claimed, so is there any meaning like uh, uh, to predict the food effect if we do not have any clinical like the food effect uh, uh, to validate the model? Is there any meaning like uh, to uh, predict uh, like the food effect at the early discovery or development uh, phase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think there's, uh, you know, there is some evidence. Uh, let's see, I think we're referring to this this publication here from 2018, uh, where there were 30, there were 40, let's, we'll call it 40, use a round number, uh, prospective predictions. And 90% of these were within twofold. When we talk about first in human predictions, let's say not food effect, but when we talk about first in human predictions with PBPK modeling, and we're taking the available in vitro data, and we're taking the available um, uh, animal data to build a PBPK model and predict first in human exposure, our goal is to try and be within twofold. Um, here with this food effect data, where we're taking some of the in vitro data, some of the in vivo animal data, or some of the early in vivo human fasted state data to predict the food effect. And in 90% of the cases, so 36 out of 40 of the cases, there is a prediction within twofold. That should tell you that there is value in being able to run these simulations early in your drug development programs prior to performing the first food effect studies. Because you will have good clues. You will have good information. The, the extent of the food effect may not be predicted as accurately as you would like, but the likelihood of a food effect and the direction of the food effect, whether positive or negative, will be captured very well. And you'll be able to then utilize this information early on to start anticipating what you might need to do, especially from a formulation perspective, to try and either enhance or in most cases, try to mitigate or reduce the food effects, food effect risks that you're likely to see. So I actually think this is a good, this is a good publication in support of food effect modeling, especially at early stages of a project. Um, and I think there, the update that came from the IQ consortium, so the updates that came from industry experts who built 30 drug models and did food effect predictions, looking at all different types of, of molecules and all different types of mechanisms. Again, we saw in this updated work that there were 80% over 80% of the cases that were predicted with good confidence. And so I think that this publication, the publication from the Gastro Plus user group, and even the work from the FDA shows the value of being able to do these predictions early in drug development to help understand what is the uh, likelihood the direction, the magnitude of an expected food effect and use that information to help early on try to uh, evaluate different formulation strategies. Yeah. Uh, 
可以看到，对于这个三十九个例子，这个对于这个 full effect 的这个预测的话，百分之九十它是这个 AUC 是在两倍之内的。然后，如果我们考虑到在呃这个人体的首预测的话，如果在两倍之内，实际上我们就认为它是很好的预测了。然后我们可以考虑到，在这里面，呃，我们根据它这个 in vivo 的这个，嗯，呃，这个呃空腹情况下的数据，还有根据这个，呃，这个模型的一些这个 in vitro 的 data， 还有这个模型之内的这个，呃，已经呃考虑到的这些生理学参数的变化，我们可以看到，这实际上这个预测是一个，嗯、呃。应该是一个一个比较好的预测了，因为百百分之九十都是在这个两倍之内的。然后在后面一篇文献，他也提到了，他们呃也是用不同的这个呃嗯这、呃、化合物来进行预测，然后他们也是百分之这个八十以上都是在这呃呃物产呃这 AUC 都是在两倍之内的。然后在这种情况下，虽然我们知道它并没有给我们呃一个特别准确的这个预测，但是至少它告诉我们，就是说这个食物可能会导致的嗯某些影响，它是这个 positive 的还是 negative 的话，然后我们可以就是说帮助我们呃，如果我们在早期的话进行预测的话，也可以帮助我们就是说我们可以知道呃呃可以在我们进行实现之实验之前，然后它可以帮我们预测到这个食物可能会产生哪一些影响，然后这些影响会有多大，可以给我们。一些这个预测，帮我们这个是呃，在呃，就是说呃，并且我们可以用这个模型来这个预测，可以如何来减少这个食物的这个影响。OK， 这样。I will come to the next question。嗯。So I think the next question you already mentioned, like,、uh, can food effect predict? Uh, by mechanistic modeling uh, guide formulation screening, so as to avoid the influence of food effect on PK. Yeah, I think you already mentioned that. So we could use like the、uh, the, the modeling try to decrease the food effect. Yeah. Do you yeah, want, this, have extra to comment? Yeah. No, I mean just very very quickly, Haiying,、uh, and thank you for the question.、Um, Yeah, this this is a really nice publication to which talks about、uh, with a real case from Novartis. They had observed a pretty significant positive food effect for their compound at different dose levels, and what they wanted to try and do is see if there could be some ways to try and eliminate the food effect so that the PK would be、uh, equivalent between fasted and fed conditions, and、um, so once this model, the baseline model, was in place and accurately captured the PK under both fasted and fed conditions across dose levels,、um, you are able to perform、uh, design of experiment type simulations, and in this case here. Running simulations across different ranges of doses and particle sizes, d50 values, and what they saw was there would be an opportunity to design a new formulation that would have the same absorption across all the clinical doses under both fasted and fed conditions. The issue here was that. The formulations would have to be nanoparticle formulations with small, very small particle sizes. And、uh, Novartis ultimately decided that it was going to be too expensive, and、um, there would be too much variability with these nanoparticle formulations to go down this path. So they decided to stick with their conventional. Formulation strategies, but this did show that there could be an opportunity to design a new prototype to mitigate the、uh, the food effect which was observed here. So, absolutely, this is a very common application of PDPK models. Once you have a baseline validated model in place, predicting both fasted and fed data like this. You can unlock the true power of the model 
to begin to assess different formulation strategies to try and mitigate it. 呃，这个呃，这个问题的答案是是的，你可以用模型来帮助你，呃呃，来减少这个 food effect。在这里这样给了一个例子，然后它是 Novartis 的一个呃 compound， 呃，然后它首先在我们可以看到，呃，对于它这个传统的剂型，然后对于它这个传统的剂型，我们可以看到它呃是有这个食物效应的，然后它为了取消食物效应，它做了一个。呃，敏感度分析，然后发现如果这个呃粒径比较小的话，然后这样就可以这个呃避免这个食物效应。但是由于这个粒径范围经过模拟出来的话，它是一个在这个 nanoparticle 的这个范围之内，所以说他们决定还是用他们的 conventional 的这个方呃这个传统的 formulation。但是我们可以看到，在这个例子中，用模型的话，去可以帮助我们，呃，去发现有一些这个呃呃，某一些这个变化，它剂型的变化的话，是可以帮助我们减少这个 food effect。Yes. Uh, let's see the next question. Um. So I think the next question is. Uh, Uh, how can we optimize the PBPK model when the result of food effect modeling are significantly different from the observed result? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, an example would be um, let's see, uh, maybe here. Uh, this is uh, the one of the case studies that was presented in the webinar where the uh, prospective prediction. Was able to uh, correctly estimate the likelihood of a food effect and the direction, but it overpredicted what the observed PK data looked like. And this is where you would have to perform sensitivity analysis and also try to better understand what is the mechanism of the food effect. In the case of something like this, where there's a negative food effect, um, we talk a little bit about this theory of the ion pair formation and the interruption of that formation. This would reflect a change that would be needed to the permeability of the drug molecule. So if we were going to be running some sensitivity analysis on this model, one of the parameters we would choose to look at would be PEF, and very likely we would have to try and optimize the permeability in order to get a better match to this data, based upon uh, a little, a, a more um, uh, comprehensive or thorough uh, review of what the mechanism. Of that food effect is. Uh, if I go to uh, let's see, back over here, this is talked about a little bit more. Um, this publication from the IQ group, the the mechanism of the interaction, whether there's uh, solubilization from bile salts, whether it's the Interaction of the food with enzymes or transporters, whether it's the、uh, binding of the food to the drug molecule, which will、um, modify the permeability value,、uh, whether it has some effect on gastric emptying or GI motility, these are things that we would have to try to understand through sensitivity analysis and some further research. In order for us to get some clues about what parameters we might need to optimize in our model, in order to predict and capture that food effect well, so understanding more about your compound,、uh, the BCS,、uh, and of course the the various、uh, drug properties,、uh, and then using something like sensitivity analysis to evaluate whether It's a physiological mechanism, whether it's some interaction of the food with、uh, the permeability, the、uh, enzymes, the transporters, or whether it might be something else, which then needs to be optimized in the model. 
we'll get some clues based upon what we can ultimately understand and learn about the mechanism of that food effect. 嗯,在有些情况下,你这个预测,在餐后的预测适合你的实测只是可能会有差异的。刚才这样也给了一个例子,然后我们可以看到是这个模型很好的预测它这个对于这个AOC的这个减少,这个我们可以看到它这个negative the food effect。但是我们这个预测出来的这PK-profile和observed之间这个还是有差异的。在这种情况下呢,实际上建议大家是要用这个参数的敏感度分析。因为在这幅图上我们可以看到,它也给出了就是这个食物,food,可能会对PK或者是
，然后在这里面这样也可以，也显示了呃这些内容。呃，你我们可以看到，比如说这个 gastric emptying time， 它实际上是和这个呃这个食物的这个呃 calorie 是相关的。我们可以看到，基本上是有一个线性的关系。然后由于这个不同的 meal 的话，然后它和它这个 calorie 还有里面的这个 fat， 呃，这个不同的这个情况，它实际上它对这个。pH 还有 bio salt， 呃，都是有影响的。在 g a s t r o p l a s 这个模型里面，呃，我们已经考虑到呃所有的这些变化，这些变化我们、呃、你可以通过选择不同的这个 meal， 然后 g a s t r o p l a s 自动呢就会进行呃这个 pH 啊 transient time 啊，还有这个呃 bio salt， 呃都呃就会自动的就是嗯、呃、根据现有的这些呃嗯。呃呃呃，发表的文献，然后我们已经内建了一些模型，然后来帮助大家进行这些这个生理学参数的变化。Yeah, I think we、uh, come to the um uh next the last question. I think it's not related with the fat speed, but it's more related with our uh population data where it's come from. So. Where does the virtual population database come from? Is it necessary to consider the difference in of race, such as European and American people and the Chinese people? Uh, do you want to answer this one, Haying? Yes. Uh, yes. So, yeah. So for the so we、If、did like. To,、uh, so, sorry, Haying. If you want to just go right into Chinese, that's okay. Into Mandarin. Okay. Sorry, I just forgot. Yeah, okay. So, in in this gastro plus, we have the present of this, uh, um, especially this model, uh, human population of this data. We have, uh, the Western population, American population, and the Chinese population, and the Japanese population, and the Chinese population, and the Chinese population. And then, uh, we have considered that, uh, for the different population groups, first, uh, we have considered these differences because we have, first, 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 这个不同的这个体重是不同的，然后对一些这个酶酶的分布是不同的，然后所有的这些呃呃，我我们如果能够发呃，能够就是说在文献中呃呃，能够发现的这些变化，我们都已经加入到这个 gastro plus 里面，比如说这些呃呃。组织器官的这个呃 size 的差异，然后这个酶的差呃差异，然后我们都呃考虑到呃在这在这个模拟数据这个模拟人群的这个数据库里面了。对于呃呃西方的人群，这个 American 的人群，我们主要用的是这个 Enhance 这个数据库。然后对于这个日本的人群和中国的人群，我们是用了一些政政府的这个呃呃 survey 的政府的这样一些这个数据库，然后我们来建立的。所以说，呃，那、呃、我就是说，呃，如果你建模 C B P K 模型的话，呃，这个欧美人群和这个亚洲人群或者中国人群。还有这个日本人群，我们你是要选择不同的这个模拟呃人群的数据库来进行模拟的话，因为我们之间是有呃在某一些方面是有差异的，嗯、呃，就是像刚才我提到的，就是说嗯、呃，对于比如说呃一个这个人群内的这个体重身高的分布，然后人群内的这个呃呃这个酶的分呃酶的表达量，这个或者是。呃，转运体的表达量，然后这个呃血流量，或者是这个组织器官的大小，都是有差异的。在这些呃里面，如果我们呃能够发现数据，我们都考虑到了。嗯、呃，所以说建议你就是说呃，还是要选择不同的人群来进行相应的这个 PPPK 模型的预测。嗯、呃，我来，下面我来看一下这个、呃 ，Tony 有没有问题？呃、yeah. uh, ，it seems j o h it seems there is no yes。对，应该没没应该没问题的，看问题应该都发过来了。OK。Yeah。j o h it seems there is no extra questions。Yeah。Thank you。Thank you, Hai Ying, for helping to translate.、Uh, thank you to Farmago for helping to organize. Thank you, everybody, for carving out time from your busy schedules to learn more about. The application of PBPK modeling to help support、uh, food effect evaluation.、Uh, please stay safe, and、uh, 
continue to utilize modeling and simulation to drive your research programs and regulatory interactions forward. Have a good day, everybody. Okay, thank you, Jiang, and uh, thank you, Ai. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Ah, okay. Bye-bye. Uh, uh,